expectations you can see to its own momentum, partly because you see that, that most people in China are not spending 24-7 scheming about their day in the sun as the dominant power of the world, <laughs> but how to get an apartment for their son, or how to do okay on the university entrance exam, or how to not get laid off in the little factory in southern China, or, or whatever the, 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 the rest. And so, without belaboring all this, I started, what I wanted to discuss here is why should such things be a surprise? In an era where we have more thorough communications than ever before in, in, in history, why should this more complex and human and in a way less frightening but more challenging in other ways we were trying to, why should that be a surprise to people uh, like, like me and like many of us, I think, who have only read about the place but haven't experienced for, firsthand? What does that tell us about our systems for understanding other parts of, of, of the world? There are some obvious reasons for this. One is, as many of you know here, it is simply, it's exciting to be in China, but it's no picnic. That, that the pollution is a factor. The language is a factor. Either you have spent a lot of time studying it, or you haven't, and it's a, a factor in your life either way. Travel can be an adventure uh, in, in, in good ways, but difficult ways. And so, so it's the, the fact of, of simply having this first-hand exposure is harder than it is in many parts of the world. And it seems more than most places I've seen First-hand exposure seems to be indispensable for having some kind of, 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 of this balanced view. And first-hand exposure other than in the big hotels of Beijing and Shanghai. Now, one of my plans, if I were king, or when I'm called upon to be king, one of my plans will be to not have any non-stop flights from the U.S. to either Beijing or Shanghai. They're all going to have to go and wait for a while in Xi'an or in Chengdu or Rumuji or wherever. Uh, and and so to see some of the range of experiences that are in China that's not all Pudong, which, which we, we marvel at. And so, so part of the reason here is simply that it's hard to get the first-hand uh, exposure to China that gives some sense of the, these variations. But I think there also is something about the, the ways in which our institutions for, for knowing about the world, that is, both China's efforts to explain itself and our efforts through academics and journalism to explain it, there are some problems this system encounters in dealing with China right now that are different from those of most other parts of the world and most other times of, of, of history. And let me talk about um, the, the Chinese side of that and then the Western press side of that. The Chinese side of it is a, a, phenomenally, a phenomenally inept system for presenting its story to the outside world. I think there is one of the stereotypes of the, uh, the coming Chinese dominance that you sometimes hear in the West is that people are all like Zhou and Mai, they're all very sophisticated about the world, they're canny in being able to charm uh, people with, with Western sensibilities. Uh, that was not my experience at all. Uh, my experience was that, that the Chinese, parts of the Chinese foreign ministry or propaganda machine, th those parts that are deeply sophisticated in dealing with the outside world, are for that very reason weak and powerless within the Chinese system. And the people who do have the power are um, almost 100% focused on internal Chinese affairs that if a line of argument is good in stamping down dissent or building support or making the government seem strong inside China, then that line is used. And if the outsiders don't like it, that's the outsider's problem. We can understand this, this mentality. I say, I was going to make a political joke, but I will, I will, I will not do that. I'll wait for somebody to ask for that later on. But we can, we can, think, of, we can think of political leaders who really uh, don't care much about the outside world and only say things for domestic American consumption. If you imagine a government run by those people, I think you have something like the, uh, the Chinese system for explaining itself to the outside world. It's significant that the, much, much of the business and financial leadership of China now has been shaped by these past 30 years of graduate education around the world. Notably the U.S., also Britain, uh, France, Australia, and other places. And they do have a sense of how the outside world thinks and the processes information and thinks of China and all the rest. And so I often uh, am impressed by the 
texture and the nuance of such people in talking about the outside world. For example, uh, many of you uh, know the name Gao Xiqing, the man who's in charge of the China Investment Corporation, which is probably, so he probably controls the single, the single largest pool of China's investments in the United States. He is somebody who went to Duke Law School and worked on Wall Street for Richard Nixon's old law firm and has in his office in Beijing, he has a picture of Martin Luther King over his desk. Now, I suspect he may have put that picture there when I was coming to interview him, but who knows? <laughs> the fact that he knew he put it up the day I was coming to interview him is something. And that, that he could, could um, make jokes in colloquial English about his nephew who works for Google in California and all the rest. My point is that within the political leadership, there is a very small supply of such people. These are people who are internally trained within the, within the Chinese system, and so they are the ones who make the notable comments, for example, that the Dalai Lama should be thought of to be a, uh, a jackal in Buddhist monk's robes. This was the official English um, rendering of a, of, of a comment about him, or the, the famous comment of how, about before President Obama's visit last fall, that he should actually sympathize with the Chinese government's view about Tibet, because after all, he, as an African-American, would have sympathized with the civil war in the U.S., and the civil war was basically like the, the uh, liberation of Tibet. Therefore, um, Barack Obama should support the Chinese position. Uh, so this, this, showed, this showed some but not complete familiarity with the American <laughs> mind, mindset. Uh, and this all, also it concluded by saying, therefore, Chairman Mao was functionally equivalent to Abraham Lincoln, and, and President Obama should therefore be happy. So, so the, I think part of the problem is the Chinese government, for internal reasons, is mainly used to, to puffing up its might, to putting on ceremonies like the opening, uh, opening rites for the Olympic Games and the 60th uh, anniversary um, yes, the parade that we saw last fall, and not knowing or caring how these will be received elsewhere. But there also is a challenge that our intelligence systems, by which I mean the press, I'm using intelligence not in the classified sense, but in the, in the brain sense, a challenge that we all face in trying to convey the complicated reality there. I speak not with even the faintest criticism of the people who work year in, year out, in China to explain it to readers in the English language and French and German and Italian. I really, really admire people who are there. And I think that in terms of just depth of talent, probably the journalistic core working in China and explaining it to the world surpasses the journalistic core you will find any place else. Of, of really knowing the subject, having high language <coughs> skills, high historic skills, and all the rest. But there is a problem they have in trying to convey this reality of China, because the things which are most striking if you go there and say, gee, this is different from what I read, don't usually constitute news. The fact of the ordinary chaos of Chinese life and the individualism of people and their motives and all the other things which make this complicated and in many ways unthreatening um, uh, collectivity I'm describing are not news in the way that the jailing of a dissident is undeniable news or the showdown with Google or threatening remarks on the diplomatic front, or, or whatever else. And when this very sophisticated core of correspondence in China is dealing with editors and even more readers in the United States who are interested in sort of a simpler plot line, and the plot line we've all been conditioned to have is, holy moly, China is taking over. And that's basically the plot line which has been in place for the last 10 or 15 years. It becomes very hard to get across what daily reality uh, impresses you with. So I do not have a fix or answer for this situation. As I suggest later on, there may be a sort of self-healing part of the ongoing interaction between the US and China, but I observe it as a real issue, that, that the kind of gap of truth I'm suggesting about China, or at least what I contend to be the truth, is there, especially a lot of books about the place, and if you read some of the feature stories people can do, it's there. But the news that these skilled people have to usually report is about the episodic, um, the episodic harsh realities that are part of the whole Chinese scene, but are a smaller part than I think they see in, in daily life there. One way I was uh, discussing this with some friends uh, in Beijing a year ago would be as if the news from the United States were 80% about Guantanamo. Now, Guantanamo...